Let's get to know the second batch of Pacers new guys with those who know them best, people who covered them at their previous stops. We'll know the latest on Enrique Freeman, Cole Swider, and Quentin Jackson on today's Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, y'all? Happy Monday. Hope you had a great weekend and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI. And today, the second part of an offseason series where we learn more about the Pacers' new players from people who know the most about them. Last time, we did Johnny Furphy with our Locked On Jayhawks host. We did James Wiseman with our Locked On Pistons host. And we did Tristan Newton with our Locked On UConn host today. The other three new guys, Cole Swider, Enrique Freeman, and kind of Quentin Jackson, not new to the Pacers. He joined them in March, but only five months with the team, and fans don't know much about him, so I'm including him here. So, Locked On Heat host going to talk Cole Swider, plus someone from Mid-Major Madness, Ian Sachs, is going to talk Enrique Freeman, and who better to talk about Quentin Jackson someone who played with him, Kyle Mangus, kind enough to help us out, and then I'll play an interview with Quentin Jackson himself. So you get to learn quite a bit about him from him. Lots of good stuff today as you learn more about Pacers new players this Took uh, just given my life a, a couple days to put together, so I'll be in a different outfit and setting every day. Hopefully, it all sounds great and together, and hopefully, you learn a lot about these Pacers new guys. Let's start with Enrique Freeman and hop right in. Let's talk some Enrique Freeman, the most unique journey to the NBA, I think, of anyone I've covered in the last five years with this Pacers team. And who better to break down someone who played in the MAC for years? It's very hard to find people who cover the MAC and keep up with the MAC. But Ian Sachs of Mid-Major Madness and a sports anchor up in South Dakota does. Ian, uh, when did you realize that Enrique Freeman could actually be an NBA-level player? Because it's very rare for a player who goes to college, not for basketball, to get to that point in their life. I think it was uh, throughout his last year of college and just – looking at the progression that he's had throughout his four or five years, uh, I guess you could say, of college at Akron, when you look at his numbers increasing every year, and then you look at his mid his, uh, double-double uh, tally from this year, 31, that's hard to draw your attention away from when you're looking at, at bigs that could translate into the NBA. And uh, you know, he's a little undersized to play in the post in the NBA, but still, if you put up almost 13 rebounds a game, that's an effort thing. That doesn't really tell you anything about his size. And effort translates no matter what level of basketball you're playing at, whether it's, you know, Little League basketball growing up or or the cream of the cream in the NBA. Yeah, we saw that out in Summer League, right? I was out in Vegas for those first two games and here he comes off the bench and he's getting more rebounds than everybody and fighting like crazy. And they're like, Hey, this guy, we need him to close games. He's our best option, you know, in the post, because that stuff did it, at least in that setting kind of translate something he talked about after he got drafted was he, he like t- tested the pre-draft waters the year before that. I think he only had two or three workouts with teams, but all the feedback he got was you need to be a more modern front court player if you're going to be in the NBA, right? And I think that's the case for a lot of college guys. In what ways did you kind of see his game transform in that way? Like there's the the headline one would be that he actually took some threes, um, but in what ways kind of on the perimeter with mobility did you see him get better in that final year with the Zips? Well, you mentioned it right there, Tony, with the threes. He attempted six three-pointers throughout his entire career through his first four years of playing. He took – what is it? 53, I think 54 three pointers last year, made 20 of them. He was one of six entering his final year of college, then went 20 for 54, shooting better than 35% from the three point line. That right there tells you that one, he works on his game two, the hours that he puts in translates to what he does on the court. And just the way that he worked at it and the development that you saw there over the last year tells you that in this NBA, you don't see the traditional post of back to the basket, staying on the block, not moving more than seven feet away from the basket. Everyone has range. So now, especially since he's going to be a little undersized for a post, that range is going to pay dividends as he translates into the NBA. But then also you look at his mobility without the basketball, being able to cut and slash, that's probably going to be a role that he'll 
slide into in the NBA. Uh, he's not going to match up against the the jokers of the world and the Embiid's of the world banging down low. He's probably going to be more of a wing and his ability to move on the perimeter, move without the basketball, and then also his passing ability. I know he only had a couple of assists per game uh, throughout his college career, but you watch some of his film, some of the moves and, and passes that he makes, his court vision, very above average and an underrated part of his game. I think he only had one or – I'm not saying this to to like shoot down his pass ability, but he, had one or, he only had one or two of these, but he had a couple of summer league passes where he was like stuck in traffic with a bunch of guys around him and just like found a way to shuffle it to an open teammate for a shot. And I was like, oh. Oh, I didn't know you had that kind of vision passing in you. And like, if you can be patient enough to find those, that that's impressive. That will matter. And at, at any context of basketball and something you talked about is him working on his, his game and his threes and his being a more modern big, taking that advice to heart. And I, I don't know why this has stuck with me for so long, but I think five years ago, P Kevin Pritchard, the Pacers front office leader talked about some players, the team signed in for agency and something he liked about a couple of them were they got better every year in the NBA. And to him, that meant, but besides that they're getting better and working on their game, they really like basketball, right? Because they're willing to put the time into it to get better. And that matters when you're in the NBA, right? You have to like the sport to actually commit to it and get better. And I think that with Freeman going through the process, receiving feedback, taking it to heart, doing all those things and being that player has to resonate well with any team, which is why he got drafted after, you know, a five-year career where he didn't even have a, a basketball scholarship to go to the school. What do you think of him defensively, right? I, I know it's kind of hard to evaluate sometimes bigs in, a, in the context of college basketball um, and especially in the MAC. but what do you think of what he was as a defender at that level and how that could potentially move up to the pros? He, he puts in that effort. We talked about it, uh, you know, just right there, you were saying about how he puts in the effort to work on his game, work on his craft, improve the three, his three point shooting and improve his scoring numbers uh, every year that he was in college. But it also comes up on the defense. It shows you that there's effort. Defense is a lot of times about effort and putting in the, the extra effort to get, I know I keep using that word, but that's really what, what defense kind of is all about. And you look at some of the top defenders that the Pacers have, you look at a, a TJ McConnell who started his career at Duquesne. That's a mid major. So, and then worked his way to Arizona and now the NBA and, and shining with the Pacers throughout their uh, their playoff run last season. But I think that that kind of gives you an idea of what Enrique Freeman can do on the defensive end. He puts in the, those hustle plays and will get uh, into the opposing players. I, I almost want to compare him a little bit to an OB Toppin. He's not quite as athletic as OB Toppin, but I think that there are similar aspects to his game that he shares both with Toppin and McConnell, and look at what both of them have done. Key contributors to the Pacers' run last season. Uh, I did not expect a TJ McConnell comp, but I totally get where you're coming from, right? And and TJ, after transferring, was like, oh, this guy could belongs at this level. And in the NBA, oh, this guy belongs at this level, right? It just kept happening. I think something similar could happen to Freeman. And it's weird evaluating college defense because, like, you watch him and he gets blocks and he's in the right spots, but like it wasn't super standout and yet he made Mac all defense four times, right? So he was doing something right and, and causing chaos and was, I think, the conference defensive player of the year once, but it wasn't the most recent season. Um, no, I, I want to say either uh, either after his second or third year seeing, you know, traditional minutes, um, his freshman year, you know, he played, I, I think, only about a handful of games. And then uh, starting yeah. his second year of college was when he – really became a, a key contributor for the Zips. But I think I think also you have to look at his de his uh, rebounding numbers. And you think about putting – getting. I remember one of my – I think it was my high school basketball coach saying, like, the way to finish a defensive possession is by collecting the rebound. And you don't think of that. You, you think of, okay, you know, defending, uh, trying to get a steal maybe or, or uh, b blocking a shot or uh, preventing the uh, opposition from – getting a, a shot off. But in the end, the way that you finish a defensive possession, getting a defensive rebound. He had 13, he averaged 12.9 rebounds last season. That's a big number to stop a defensive possession. Yeah. And another guy the Pacers pulled out of college um, on the undrafted market though, that was 
maybe not quite center size, but played like a center and was had awesome rebounding numbers and mid major Anis, I'm sure covered this play. That was Terry Taylor, right? And you and you go back and they say, Oh, our our they said our analytics staff identified this guy as someone who could be good, and he was, and he's been a four-year NBA pro now. And it's like that'll always sit with me looking back at you know, there's some there. Uh, I don't know what the number is, but there's some level of production where it's just like, yes, this is this is clearly something we should be looking more at, even if they're a 24 year old going to be rookie. Um, can you remember or do you know of a player off the top of your head besides Enrique who entered college not playing basketball and made the NBA? I could not come up with any. No, no. <laughs> and that's the one of the I, I would think the best part of Enrique's journey is that, you know, it's not really talked. I, I know it's talked a lot about, but you kind of have to take a step back and, and really think about how remarkable that is that he walked on to a mid-major basketball team. And Tried out to walk on. Draft yeah. Right. Yeah. Like I would have loved to walk on to a bas to my college basketball team. Don't think that five years later, I'd be hearing my name called in the NBA draft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think that says everything about, the effort, the hustle plays, and the ability to get better every year. And, hey, when you're really big and you get a bunch of rebounds and you block a bunch of shots, like, hey, you average eight and nine as a 20-year-old sophomore who wasn't on the team right away. You're going to impress your coaches. Ian, this was wonderful. Thank you for the time and context surrounding Enrique Freeman. Uh, where can people find your work covering mid-major programs like Akron and much more? Uh, sure. Mid-major madness, uh, midmajormadness.com. Uh, we're also on Twitter. Our Twitter is – is great um certainly worth a follow and then um uh you know kind of the slow part of the year right now but with colleges starting the uh, right now in the second half of august the the ramp up in uh, early november will certainly be here way sooner than any of us uh could imagine and then it's a full sprint to the NCAA tournaments, conference championships, and, uh, you know, hopefully having a, a mid-major or two in the final four. I suspect we'll see several people making the drive from Akron to Indianapolis. Now that is possible because of Enrique Freeman. Ian, thank you very much for the time. Hey, everybody. We have to quickly talk about game time. I love going to live events no matter what. I mostly love basketball, but comedy, theater, I dig it, and Game Time is the best way to get to those events. They have a new feature called Game Time Picks. It makes getting tickets to your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats. You don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. They have super deals, which is a great way to see the best deals, uh, uh, many tiers of deals that can show you based on where you're sitting. I love Game Time. I've used it myself because it's the best way to get tickets to anything. The views from your seat feature, you can turn off hidden fees, um, there's no guesswork there. They have the game time guarantee, which means you know you're getting the lowest price. They have event cancellation protection. Everything you would want in a ticket buying uh, place is all there. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use the code Lockdown NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create the account and use the code L O C K E D O N NBA. You'll get $20 off on game time. Download game time today. What is it? It's game time. He's here to compete for that last roster spot. It's Cole Swider. He's played for the Lakers. He's played for Villanova. He's played for Syracuse. He's played for the Heat. A lot of programs that end up churning out players that look better later in their careers. And who better to talk about Cole Swider than the person who watched the majority of his NBA appearances because they came with the Heat last year. It's Wes Goldberg from Locked on Heat. Wes, uh, I, I, just, I, I guess I'll get right to the key thing. Is he just a shooter? Is he more than a shooter? What's the sales pitch for Cole Swider? Because you look at these G League three-point numbers and really every stop except really for the NBA, you're like, oh my God, Cole Swider can really shoot it. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I thought you were introducing me as the guy that was competing for the last Pacers <laughs> roster spot. And then I realized we were talking about Cole Swider. But Cole Swider is an every man's man. So it's basically the same thing. Uh, just a guy's guy. Um, I do have a brief Cole Swider story. But before I get to that, to answer your question, um, He's just a three-point shooter, but he's a really good one. And in summer league, he shot, and I'm not making this up, I'm pretty sure I have it right, 60% from three-point wow. range. Now, it is just summer league, but whatever. Like, his G League numbers were awesome. Um, I've seen him shoot in person. I, I, I've i I've seen a lot of NBA players shoot in person. Cole Swider, and I've seen a lot of the elite shooters shoot in person. Cole Swider is an elite three-point shooter. There's not much else that he does on the court. 
Uh, the one thing I will say, based on where he was, even when he was a two-way guy, because I was kind of doing the same exercise you were doing, he was a two-way guy with the Lakers, and then the Heat picked him up uh, going into last year. So I was kind of doing the film work on him, and he was very much a standstill shooter, above the break corners, but standing still. And over the last couple of years, he's developed into some movement shooter stuff. He can come off screens. He can come off those handoffs. And those things are very, very important. That's really what I think takes a good shooter to an elite shooter at the NBA levels. Can you do it on the move? Can you do it off screens? Can you do all that kind of stuff? And he can. He definitely can. He can make challenging shots. He's taller than you think. So he can get that shot op uh, over a lot of defenders. He's an elite three-point shooter. Um, the question is whether or not he can hold up defensively, whether or not he can develop other skills in his offensive game that can get him onto the court. But if you need a guy to get in there and, and make a three pointer, he's a good, he's a good option. He showed so much shooting that now three teams have said, let's try it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Let, let's, let's see what this can be. And I actually noticed what you said about the movement shooting. When you dive into like the shots he took last, just the ones he took for the heat, not the ones he necessarily made. Like he, he would catch it on the left wing in transition shot fake and then keep moving to the corner and shoot. He shot very well from the corners. Uh, with yeah. Heat last year, I was like, oh, wow, that was like a pretty hard three. And he just buried it. Um, and he actually played not a lot, as you obviously, you know this. But for my listeners, like, he actually played some like in the rotation. It was not frequent, but the Heat were so banged up. They needed him to play play, not just be this garbage time two-way guy. So he has like real experiences with them. What was your Swider story? I I'm now intrigued by this. Yeah, so he, uh, so I live in Miami. I'm about a mile away from the arena, which is downtown. And there's uh, a an outdoor, indoor mall called Brickle City Center in Brickle, which is a block from where I live. And I was just walking around with my wife. I think we're getting lunch or something on the first floor of this. I think it's a four story mall, essentially. And there's Cole just sitting there on a on a bench outside the restaurant. And he had he actually has a podcast and he had had me on his podcast because I think we had him on our podcast because August content and uh <laughs> or it was like september content i don't know and so he was like well this is an nba person i'll bring him on my podcast to talk about like an nba season preview and so we kind of got to know each other a little bit and then I, I got to know him in training camp a little bit we would kind of talk off to the side a bunch and he's a really nice guy and then i see him and he's like six seven he looks like a basketball player right and uh i see him just on a bench and then i just go and he, he waves at me and i wave at him and then i go up to him and, I, and we just start chatting and i find out that you know like this is where he is and this is what he's doing and whatever and we, you know it's just small talk whatever and then i walk away and my wife was like who the f was that and why was he so tall and i've never seen this person in my i know all of your friends were married who is this person and i was like oh that's cole swider he plays for the heat and she was like oh my god i'm wearing a heat t-shirt right now <laughs> I'm like, well, it's, I'm really glad you didn't go over there because that would have been embarrassing. But that's my Cole story. Really nice guy. Really great guy. My fiance has talked about how if she was famous, she would want to be like that. Like, like I'm, I'm in the NBA, but I'm like so unknown that I can go to the mall and sit on a right. bench and like no one will ever talk to me. Right. Like, I think right. that'd be kind of awesome. Yeah. Uh, I did not know he had a himself. podcast. That is now the, uh, the, the next the thing Cole Swider show. It's easy to, easy to remember. Oh God. I was going to say, I hope I can remember all that together. Um, <laughs> Why didn't the Heat actually retain him? Because I, I I believe if I have this correctly, it was qualifying off for sent, so he was restricted. Then they pulled it, but they had like a lot of good summer league players, right? The Heat won the summer league championship, so they had to figure out Josh Christopher and all these other guys. Is there an actual a, a reason they didn't keep him, or was it just that other guys were good in summer league too? Um, yes, right. It, it's a little bit of all of the above. They really like Cole Swider. It was not easy for them to rescind the qualifying offer. They did it, from what I understand, because it was kind of the right thing to do. Cole Swider was holding out for a regular roster spot. He really wanted a regular roster spot. And if you, you know, the Miami Heat, they have 14 guys on standard contracts. They have an open 15 spot. They're not going to fill it because they're so close to that second apron that to fill it, they would just go over that second apron and it's just not worth doing that. So um, I think when all of that, they, they offered him that qualifying offer early on in free agency, him and Alondis Williams, uh, who were both on two ways for Miami last year. And then as... You know, the offseason shook out. It just got to a point where they didn't have enough money. So he played all of Summer League. He was amazing in Summer League, was one of the team leaders for the team that you mentioned, but won the Summer League championship. Uh, it was not an easy decision, but it was the right thing to do because he did, he was getting other sort of offers from other teams. And so, um, you know, I think it was, a, it wasn't just the Heat saying, we're kind of done with this experiment. It was, I think him and I think it was the heat and then Cole Swider's representation kind of figuring out what was best for him. 
Uh, although I think the Heat would have had would have loved to have Cole Swider back in their G League program or possibly on one of these two way contracts. There's still one of those two ways. They did they did give one to Josh Christopher. Another one has gone to Keyshawn Johnson, an undrafted free agent who they really like. The other one's to Drew Smith, who was basically injured for most of last season. He's kind of I think he's got a chance to keep the two way spot, but he's kind of that he's on there by default right now. I think that's an open spot for training camp, but. Um, yeah, Swider decided he, he's going to go try it out in Indiana instead of uh, trying to compete for that other two-way spot and, and be on a two-way contract for you know the second year in a row in Miami. If his goal is to make a roster spot, Indiana is a good spot to compete. Right. I mean, Kendall Brown has it now, but it's very – they wouldn't have signed Swider if they didn't think there would be competition for the spot, right? So clearly he's he's competing for that. And no Exhibit 10, so he thinks he's getting on the team or he's not taking a two-way, baby. I, I like the confidence uh, there. I don't know how how often do you watch Sioux Falls? I guess you don't have to reveal that. But uh, what did you see in the G League level? Because again, the three point numbers are bananas. But you know, guys always show more than just their their main skill at that level. Would it be more embarrassing if I told you I watched zero Sioux Falls games or all of the Sioux Falls games? Ooh, I went to I game. went to fifteen Mad Ants games last year, which was the the let's say the perfect number. That's the perfect yeah. number. <laughs> well, you're lucky because your G League team is like right around the corner. Mine yeah, true. South I have to Dakota. go to South Dakota. <laughs> Even though I have <laughs> been to that arena. I have been to the arena. Wow. Outside of it. Never, it's never very nice, it. isn't it? I've heard it's awesome. It's a really nice area. You have the arena. Yeah. There is like a Holiday Inn and then there's like a Chili's or something like that. <laughs> and that's really it. That's the whole like town. The, whole, the whole neighborhood. <laughs> so uh, it's a good time. Um, I, uh, I watched tw- quite a bit of it and I forgot your question. So... <laughs> Oh, what did he do besides shooting at that level? Like, could anything come from that to the NBA? I mean, there was a little bit of, like, the two-bounce game coming off the screen. He kind of, like, to call it a drive-in kick would be generous, but, like, a two-bounce to the free-throw line and then kind of pass back out and keep the the gears of the offense moving. That's really it. He did develop a little bit. He got better defensively as the year went on, sliding his feet, whatnot, and things like that. But he's never going to be a great defender. He was very much in the Duncan Robinson development program, right? The same way that Max Struess was. The yes. same thing that all these guys was. And the, and the first thing I think – Duncan Robinson developed like an off-the-ball dribble game last year. He's gotten much better as a defender and and not fouling and all these things over the years. But if we recall, the Duncan Robinson, when he first burst onto the scene, the big part of his development program was the Miami Heat saying, "These everybody has told you what you can't do your entire NBA career. Nobody has talked about what you can do. And what you can do – is shoot the snot out of a basketball and we're going to get, and you're a very good shooter. We're going to turn you into the best shooter in the NBA. And for a year, he literally was, he was the best three point shooter in the, you remember that we were having NBA Twitter debates. Like, would you trade the first pick for Duncan Robinson? Like that was real. That was crazy. It was crazy. (laughs) And so they put Max Struess on the same program. They put Cole Swider on the same program. They said, there's a lot of things we know you can't do. That's not important to us. What we want to do is double down on your strength, the double down on the reason you're here. And that's your three point shooting. And they did that. Cole Swider has become even a better three-point shooter than he was when he had entered Miami. He's better now with the Pacers than he was when he got to the Heat. So that much is done. I don't really know how much more he's going to be able to develop. That really is the big question. But if he can get 10% better in all the other things, then I think there's a world where he can just kind of jump into the court on a Tyrese Halliburton-led team, run the break, just kind of run the wing and just make threes, right? Like that's the that's the great part about where his fit is now. I think the Pacers are a better fit for him than the Miami Heat were. Look at that. Yeah, with Jenny Busick leading some shooting development, Andrew Nemhard, Obi Toppin, Aaron Neesmith, to name a few have gotten better from deep here even, right? So I'll be curious what that kind of path looks like. Should he actually be on the roster? Last question, the most generic one. You've talked about his defensive limitations. He shoots who knows what else. Are. Do you actually think he's an NBA-level player? Like, is this is this going to be an experiment the Pacers are happy with by the end of the season, if he makes a team? I think he's close. I think he's close. He does need to get better defensively. He is going to get attacked relentlessly. But uh, as a guy on a 14th or 15th roster spot who plays against other bench units, as long as there's not somebody out there like LeBron James who's just going to attack <laughs> mismatches and just kind of point a finger at him and pull him up into a screen and roll and just go after him, yeah, I think he's going to be able to survive. I, I do. I think in today's NBA, you need as many three-point shooters as possible. He could be a... I. I there, I think there is a world where he becomes like a Sam Hauser type. I think that's totally plausible for him. If Cole Swider's on the floor at the same time as LeBron this season, something for the Pacers or Lakers has gone <laughs> very screwy. Wes, thank you very much for this. I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do. And I would rather bet for my 15th roster spot on a skill than a traits guy and hope he develops 
skill. So we'll see what actually happens for the Pacers in camp. But I like the idea. I like the thinking. And Wes has plenty more on Heat players. Overlocked on Heat. Do, I, do they have any ex-Pacers right now that I could say go listen to hear more about that? I don't know if they do. Uh, Thomas Bryant. Oh, good. No, 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 no. No. Yeah. Khalil Ware and Thomas Bryant. Indiana yeah. University. Yeah, yeah. That is what you can hear about on Lockdown Heat among Those many other things. That's right. That's right. Uh, Kyle Mangus from the Madness was just on here talking about his Hoosier fandom. So I'm just sneaking it in all the time here. Wes, thank you very much. Everybody, next up, let's learn some more about Mr. Quentin Jackson from Kyle Mangus himself. One more break here, guys. We can talk about the lovely folks over at FanDuel. You've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel because they're America's number one sports book. Well, we have something a little different for you this time. Now, through September 22nd, so a little less than a month, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get three-week free trial of NFL Sunday Ticket through YouTube TV and YouTube. Then, with the YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out of market NFL game. How about that? All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment you can cancel anytime. But to get that offer, $5 bet, three-week free trial of NFL Sunday Ticket from YouTube TV, you got to go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and download America's number one sports book. Check out FanDuel today. All right, last up here, I want to do Quentin Jackson. Uh, not new to the Pacers, right? I don't require another expert to really break him down, but a lot of fans do because he joined the team in March, right? So he's only been with the Pacers for five months. Uh, three regular season games, but he took one shot attempt, right? Like, there's not a lot there. So I figured, hey, I'll help fans with this one too and who better to do it than two people one quentin jackson's teammate with the uh, mad ants last year kyle mangus i asked him about quentin jackson after our podcast interview from last week so i'll just throw that in and then i did a one-on-one -on -one with quentin jackson last year i figured hey i could throw that right in too so you can actually hear from him so uh i'll do a little bit of my own opinion at the end but i think this is the perfect way to do it so here's kyle mangus on quentin jackson the guy i and the fans don't know a ton about because he joined the Pacers org late and it looks like he's coming back on a two-way. Quentin Jackson. What'd you like think of him in your limited oh, overlap yeah. with him? Yeah. I loved playing with Q. Um, brings a lot of energy to the team. Uh, we had played against him a couple times during the year with Windy City and then um, come, he comes and joins us and just, just fits right in. Helped us get a lot of wins. Um, really athletic, just bouncy, explosive, um, but great teammate too. Tries to get other people involved, play the right way, um, gets guys open shots. So um, if he plays with us this year, I'll be uh, I'll be I'll be looking forward to that because I feel like we we did build some good chemistry. Me and me and him playing in the backcourt together um, last year, and I've already talked to him a few times because he's been at the Pacers facility some. Um, just seeing him around, super hard worker, always in the gym. So good things about Q for sure. Hope you guys enjoyed that insight. Really appreciated Kyle taking the time to answer questions for me when I when I needed them. And I think he's right, right? You see Quentin as this athletic creator all the time. You saw that in Summer League. And before I insert myself and opine a little bit on what I think of Quentin Jackson and and, and his, what he'll be for the Pacers, uh, here's my one-on-one -on -one chat with him for about four minutes last year after, the I think, his first game with the Maddens. How did this all come together for you, you know, on the deadline, hearing from the Pacers getting this two-way contract chance? Uh, honestly, it was super um... – it was a shock to me, I ain't gonna lie. I really just, I was at the point where I was just kind of taking every day, day by day. And, uh, you know, I really wasn't thinking about what was next. I was just kind of focusing on, on the now. How can I get better? Um, how can I help my teammates get better? How can I, you know, bring energy to the locker room that I was in with Windy City? And then uh, uh, my coach ended up talking to me and he was like, he, he kind of just was nudging at the, at the fact that something might be coming good my way. But, you know, I kind of just, I played it smooth, you know what I'm saying? I don't really like to get my hopes too up too much um, in situations, but then when it kind of fell through, like, uh, I just was more than, I ain't gonna lie, more than everything, like, I really was just grateful, you know what I'm saying? I was blessed to have that opportunity, you know, all the work that I put in um, from the beginning of the season, from the summer, from all of that, it kind of just, you know, it came, I guess you could say late if you want to say late, but came in God's time. So, you know, I just stayed right up, you know, focused on me, focused on my teammates, focused on getting better, and that's kind of, 
how that, how that happened. You had the two experience with the Wizards last year. How do you feel like having that year in the NBA under your belt helped you this season and getting better? Um, it just it just showed me um how to stay patient with the grind. You know, everybody's time gonna come at, at some point, but when it's not your time, you just gotta focus on getting better. Focus on you. Focus on the now. Focus on the things that you can control within this organization, within this game of basketball. And so, you know, that's kind of all I've been doing this whole year is trying to keep everybody locked in on stuff like that. You've been with the Mad Ants and Pacers, obviously, but mostly with this team. Who with the Pacers have you talked with, and what kind of conversations have you had with that team? Uh, I haven't even got a chance to meet anybody on the Pacers team yet. Uh, from the time that I moved down here to now, like uh, they've been on the road, and then we've been here, and then when we've been here, they've been on the road. So it's kind of just been a little flip flop. But uh, we got one Wednesday. Um, we'll see how that goes. Have you, have you any impressions of that team? I think your NBA debut came against the Pacers last year, if I remember correctly. It might have. It might have. But I scored my first bucket on the on the. I scored my first bucket on Golden State. I can't remember if my debut was against against the Pacers, but that's that's tough. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of good things about the guys, a lot of great guys on the team. I'm um, just excited to meet them. Excited to see what a, a winning team's locker room look like. Um, excited to excited for all of it. The if you whole do process. If you do get a chance to play NBA minutes, how do you feel like you can help that team? Um, just by being me, um, being a dog on defense, um, just being aggressive on offense, making plays for other guys. Um, same stuff I always do. You know, the plan don't change. It's just bigger level, if you want to say, if you want to say that. Heard you're a car guy? What yeah. are you rocking with right now? Uh, right now, okay, so it's kind of a little bit of confusion with me driving a Subaru because uh, I got put on the spot by Craig. Uh, but I don't drive a Subaru. I, I, own, a, I own a 2013 Porsche Panamera, um, which is kind of about to be on the way to the shop. I'm about to put a kid on it. And then I got a, a 2006 BMW 750 Li. And uh, those are my only two cars right now, but I'm planning on fixing them up, getting them, getting them right. Do you have a relationship with anybody with the Pacers already via from maybe the pre-draft cycle college, anything like that? Uh, from the Pacers? I did, I did, I do. Um, them hard. He was, he was actually in my Indiana workout. He was in my Indiana workout. Um, other than that, I don't think I don't think I have any type of relationship with anybody else on the team, but you know, just trying to build that for sure. And how have you felt about this Madden's experience so far? I ain't gonna lie, I love it. I love it. I love everything about it. I love the approach. I love how we uh, attack the game. I love how we going about getting better. I love I love everything about it. I love the camaraderie around the team. We got a lot of unselfish guys, and you don't see that on lots of teams. You know, even the guys who don't get as many minutes, they always positive on the end of the bench, and I think that really helps. And I think that's a testament to why this team is so high um, in the rankings as far as, as wins. Um, so I, I I love it. Ever since I got here, they've done nothing but open their arms and show love to me. And so, you know, I'm forever grateful for them. So that's the gist. Instead of uh, calling another expert who's broken down these guys, I figured, how about someone who's played with him and the man himself? I think that people, I still think the perception of Quentin Jackson is too skewed off of one game from fans, right? Like he only played in three games for the Pacers last year, 10-ish minutes, I think 11 total. And so... Summer League was the first chance for lots of people to see him play. And I'll I'll be the first to admit that first game was not good at all. I said as much on the on the show recapping it, but every other game was awesome, right? He almost he made like a non-buzzer beater edition, like 15 shots in a row or something before his last game. And he was still awesome in that game. He just went nine for 12 instead. Right. If he again, my my take has always been if his games were flipped and his last game was first, and his first game was last, people would be like really excited about Quentin Jackson and what he can do. And and we did the breakdown on his game last week on the how they can help show. I talked about his steals. He led the summer league team in steals, right? And in the end, a guy that fans didn't really understand the signing of, which I didn't really understand the reactions to it, he averaged 11 and 4 on 63, 46, 67 splits. That's pretty dang good for the five summer league games. So, I mean, obviously, given that he wasn't a draft pick, like the, the least secure, air quotes, two-way spot, but a worthy candidate, right? He's a good player. He, If you can get by guys because you're slithery or athletic or crafty or whatever, that has NBA value. That has actual tangible on-the-court value. It'll be good for the Mad Ants if the Pacers need him for any reason. There you go. You know what you're going to get. You can put the ball in his hands, but you can't always trust guys like that. Uh, he actually has 150 minutes on an NBA floor, right? So um, now you know better about Quentin Jackson between this and the, uh, the breakdown of his game from last week. In the NBA, by the way, uh, he is shooting in total 
44 uh, percent from the field that averages of 4.8 points and 1.4 assists per game in 12.2 minutes it's not bad right so i'll be curious to see what his third year in the pros looks like and now you know more about him despite him only being with the pacers for a few months the that's the last one of these uh the first one was a while ago with johnny furphy tristan newton and james wiseman so i hope you guys know more about the new pacers uh, I don't know what day this is coming out or what tomorrow is going to be, but this week we'll do, I think, small forwards um, for the player position, historic best seasons recap. Uh, we'll talk about the rest of the, the rookies. How can they help the Pacers? Deeper dives there. We'll do our What Are the Odds summer show with Jimmy Cook. So lots of fun stuff and lineups that I'm looking forward to seeing this week in some order. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed today's show. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you very soon.